Hello and welcome to Why IP is Important to Entrepreneurship. My name is John Wood. I'm the director of the Waldron Center for Entrepreneurship and Family Business at Hardy University. And I'm fortunate today to be joined with two experts that are both intellectual property attorneys and entrepreneurs. I have Steve Lundberg and Ramya Posset. Uh, will you, uh, Steve, will you and Ramya introduce yourselves? Sure, I, I guess I'll go first. Um, so I'm a uh, principal at the uh, law firm of Schweigman Lundberg Wissner, and we specialize in uh, representing uh, uh, individuals and corporations and intellectual property matters. And in particular, uh, we do a lot of patent application preparation and uh, filing and prosecution. Um, we also routinely advise entrepreneurs and larger companies, mid-sized companies in development of IP portfolios. And I guess that that's that, you know that'll that'll do for my introduction. <laughs> Ramya? Sure. Um, thanks, John. So um, I'm actually uh, a founder and CEO of Bluefoot. So Bluefoot is a corporate strategy software company. Um, we specialize in a lot of strategy, helping IP departments figure out how many patents they should be filing, um, what what areas they should be filing patents in, what countries they should be protecting their innovations. Because when you have an innovation, it's um, it can be difficult to determine, you know, do I get a patent? Where do I file for patents for? And uh, you know, my background kind of led up to founding this company. Um, I actually started out in the tech world. I graduated from Carnegie Mellon. I was a programmer for a bit, um, and then I decided, you know, I love innovation. And I thought, you know, before I jump right into law school, let me see if I actually like patent law, right? Because I thought it was a really interesting area of kind of adjacent to technology where you were always kind of on the forefront of, you know, what's being invented. And so I went to the Patent and Trademark Office and there I was in the field of uh, cryptography. Um, so a lot of computer security stuff, which is kind of my background. And I realized I actually love it. And it's really neat seeing, you know, things that are getting invented before they even get put into products. And so I decided I wanted to make a career out of this. I went to law school. Um, I worked at a law firm afterwards in their intellectual property and kind of patent practice. And I worked with a ton of different clients across the globe and um, realized, you know, I still want to get more integrated into this. And so I went to HP. And I managed global patent portfolios there for a while, again, in the computer security space, but also what was really cool, their enterprise research lab. So again, the really cutting edge stuff where they're figuring out, you know, what's going to be the next emerging trend in technology and product. And I was there for quite a while. Um, and my last two years there, I actually also got my MBA because I really wanted to understand the business side of innovation as well, right? Because you can think about innovation um, and entrepreneurship through research and development and getting patents, but you can also think about it through, you know, buying small companies and startups that are innovative or thinking about how innovation plays a factor in the market, right? How, how a, a innovative feature in a product might increase its revenue and market share. So I wanted to get my MBA. And when I did that, I left and I started Bluefoot. So it's a long-winded answer for you, John. <laughs> oh, no, it was great. I, I enjoyed it. And I know Steve sandbags a lot. And he doesn't, he didn't mention that uh, he was his law firm and he started uh, working remote 30 years ago before anyone in the world Thought, when people thought that was crazy, and now everyone wants to work remote. So I know that uh, Steve has, has built a long, uh, as an entrepreneur in the legal practice and has had a, uh, uh, has, has, has built that business up. And Ramya, yours is an exciting business. I know you guys both work with clients that are both large and small. And you've, what are some of the mistakes that you see, uh, entrepreneurs making or companies making that uh, are related to intellectual property? What intellectual property mistakes do you see them making? Well, uh, Steve, well, John, I Steve, guess I'll jump, you, in, you I'll jump, jump in there in. for a second. And I have to say that Ramya made her 
career seemed just a whole lot more interesting than mine. Um, <laughs> well, she is interesting. That's the thing. That's like <laughs> way, way more interesting um, and fascinating, actually. I'm very, really impressed. Um, you know, mistakes, you know, I guess if I was to say anything, it would probably be, and this sounds a little self-serving, but not trusting your intellectual property counsel um, in, and taking their advice um, at, you know, um, and following, you know, the best practices that they lay down for you. I think, um, you know, I kind of see two different types of clients. Um, you know, one type of client uh, really seeks out advisors that can help them, you know, get to the next level and they put their trust in those advisors. And other clients tend to be very skeptical of lawyers, you know, now that's the minority. And they maybe think because Steve Lundberg says you should get a patent that I'm just trying to make a buck, you know, but I can assure, you know, the clients that I work with that if I don't think they should waste their money on, uh, you know, I probably, I won't, I won't recommend it, but I think that's probably not following simple instructions uh, for is, is probably the simplest, you know, one of the key errors. But, you know, I think beyond that, um, I think probably the biggest limitation I see with entrepreneurs I represent um, is that they're just underfunded and, you know, they are unable to pay or unable to acquire the patents that they might want to get um, early in the process because most everybody comes into the process broke uh, trying to find money. And so it's difficult because they're trying to get some intellectual property staked out, but patents are expensive. It takes a lot of time and money. So they tend to be um, underfunded at the beginning. And that's, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but it's just kind of a limitation that they, they uh, suffer through. Um, those are the two, you know, I guess those would be the two biggest things I see that, um, you know, that, that sometimes I, I, the latter being one that's kind of unavoidable because they don't have the money and the, the former just being a matter of you got to trust your pick a good counsel and trust them. <laughs> so, Ramya, what what mistakes do you see or have you seen uh, entrepreneurs make that could impact their intellectual property rights? Yeah, I mean, I think before you even think about getting um, the intellectual property rights, right, you have to think about how are you protecting the confidentiality of what your secret sauce is, right? Um, and I think that's something a lot of founders can struggle with. Um, so to get a patent, for example, you need to have something that no one else is making, using, selling, you know, basically putting out into the public space. And if you are, you know, I, I think there's a, a hard balance to figure out because what you want to be doing is finding out from potential customers, finding out from other people in your industry, mm. what are you doing? Is this interesting? Here's what I've got. You know, is this something you would use? But there's also a fine line of how much you're giving away of the technology that's really what's what's the secret sauce behind what's going to make you something people spend money on um, so that you don't potentially get copied, right? So I think having non, um, you know, non-disclosure agreements or confidentiality agreements in place is super important when you're talking to, especially um, often, you know, uh, most, most clients are going to sign a, an NDA, right? Um, from my experience, because I also have my own startup, right? Bluefoot is a, is a startup still. We, we suffer from the same thing Steve said, right? There's, you're always strapped for cash. Um, luckily we're not, but, you know, at the very, very beginning, it's, a lot of times self-funding or friends and family, and you've got to make decisions on where do your resources go. And oftentimes it's not something like legal or patents. Um, but I think to Steve's point, if you really want to grow this, you need to put the resources in that as early as you can, right? So that if you have something that's actually differentiating technology, you're protecting it and putting yourself in a good place that you can grow in the market. Um, but I would say the, the big thing to me is the, the, confidenti the confidentiality, right? Understanding that balance of, of who you're talking to and what you're giving away. And from my experience and from the experience of many others I know in kind of the entrepreneurship startup space, investors do not sign confidentiality agreements, right? So just be cognizant of that, especially if you're talking to an investor where they invest in a lot of the same companies 
a lot of a lot of similar type of companies in your specific space because it doesn't even have to be malicious right it can just be you know you have these ideas in your head from all these people you talk about and then a month down the line you're troubleshooting with one of the companies you've invested in and, and something pops in your head right so just be conscientious of of who you're giving away your secret sauce to and the one thing i think we mentioned when we were prepping for this call is Maybe you can't afford a patent, but everybody can afford a trade secret, <laughs> right? So when you have things that are confidential, make sure you mark them as confidential. Make sure you mark them as proprietary. Take the time to actually put those things if you're sending them out via email. If you've got a deck that has confidential information, have confidential on the slides. It's incredibly simple to do, but it can help save you in the long term because you're marking things as this is confidential information for me and the things that you don't want to get out, make sure you keep them in some place that's secure, you know, a OneDrive that's password protected or Google Drive that's password protected, whatever you want to do, but know how you're keeping your secrets all safe. Wow, you guys that's have right. mentioned a lot of things. Go, go ahead, Steve. No, I was just gonna. I was just gonna second that. I mean, if if uh, if I had given a, a a more thoughtful answer, that would be one area where I definitely say that you can make mistakes pretty easily, which is oversharing your idea. And I think the confidentiality uh, is exceptionally important. But there's, I guess, one of the ramifications of disclosing it's it goes beyond confidentiality because you have to have confidentiality coupled with i mean it's really the same thing but you got to couple it with um a, uh, you know a, a restriction on what the recipient can do with the confidential information and because one of the classic errors that or things that can happen especially happens between big companies as well and you know this john from your experience you know, one company will bring a, a uh, inkling of an idea to another company, and all of a sudden, the other company is filing 25 patent applications on all of their, you know, uh, riffing on that idea. And that happens. That can happen if you go work with an outside consultant that maybe is going to help you develop your technology. I mean, maybe they've got to keep it confidential, but if they don't have a restriction that prevents them from inventing or using their ideas and filing patent applications, you can find yourself somebody else has got more IP than you do uh, in a hurry and oftentimes better IP because they've, they know more about the idea technology and so they can come up with better versions of what you give them. So I think that's a super important one and, and definitely that would be probably the cardinal rule, if you will, of starting a business is protecting that idea carefully. You guys have mentioned a couple of things, though, is that I don't have any money, but I need to, to see an attorney for a patent. And do I need to go to an attorney for a confidentiality agreement? I would I'm an entrepreneur if... and I come to you guys and I say, uh, I, want to, I want to get an investor. What, what, what do I, you, you said that they don't sign confidentiality agreements. How do I solve this dilemma? You've got investors that don't, I don't have money. I go to see investors. They don't solve confidentiality agreements. Uh, I need to see an attorney, but I don't have money. So how do I, how do I make sense of this? If you're a student, I think um, going to the tech transfer office of your university or, or even another university, right? Um, contacting people who help out students. There are so many resources if you Google them. Um, there's also confidentiality agreements that you can get from places like LegalZoom and other things. It's not as, um, it's not as good, right? Um, to be completely candid as getting something maybe made for you, but there's, there's no harm, I think, in looking at a bunch of different confidentiality agreements that you can find as templates online and then maybe um, putting them together and seeing what makes sense for your business. And then if you take something that's already done, it's a much like a much smaller review time than maybe asking someone to, to create something from scratch, right? Um, or, you know, even taking it again to, you know, if, if your university has a lawyer, your school has a lawyer, right? Most of them do. Just speak, hey, can you put a second pair of eyes on this? Every lawyer has seen a confidentiality agreement, right? Um, and it maybe we'll be able to direct you to somebody who could help with, you know, the patent stuff on, at, a, at a lower cost. Um, and honestly, I think 
most of you, it, most entrepreneurs start out asking friends and family for money, not actual investors, unless they've done this before, mm -hmm. you know, if this isn't their first company, but you know, that's, that's where you go, right? You, you have an idea and you have the people that believe in you and believe in your idea, give you money initially. So that's, that's kind of how you get over that initial dilemma of, of talking to, um, you know, institutional investors like venture capital firms or angel investors or, you know, these angel investing networks or whatever else. And I, I guess I would, I would add to that um, or reinforce what Rami said is that there's a lot of free resources for, I mean, you can, one of the issues you run into as, as a IP advisor for a, a young company or startup is there's so much you need to learn that it's like drinking from a fire hose. And so it'd be better if you could go watch some YouTube, uh, you know, uh, videos, um, go to websites where there's a lot of information on um, starting a business, the IP, there's a lot of books and videos. And if you if, do that first, it gives you a pretty good idea what the basics are. And then there are tons of agreements that are just floating around on the internet. Now, the problem is, is picking the right one, um, but there are some pretty basic ones that most uh, that work for most situations for a, a, a startup company that might have a basic, you know, an idea they want to share. So it would be help to kind of gather some of those together, figure out what they're what they look like, read the terms. I mean, drink into them yourself as an entrepreneur, so you understand, you know, some of the legal things that are in these agreements. And then go talk to an attorney. Now, most attorneys will give you an hour's worth of their time for free. Um, to get to help you get started. I mean, I know we do that all the time, especially uh, entrepreneurs that are just getting started that need help. Um, most attorneys are more than happy to give them some free time. And then I think maybe you're going to get to this too, John, but there are actually services that can help you file patent applications if you're, you know, um, someone that, you know, can't afford a, a patent attorney. Uh, the USPTO sponsors a program for that. We participate in it. And then also our local bar here in Minnesota has a program um, that we support. So it is possible to even get a patent filed um, if you have no money. Yeah, those are good uh, recommendations. While, while we're on this, I'll throw out that the, uh, the Intellectual Property Owners uh, Education Foundation has a uh, has some videos, some free videos at ipoef.org under Ask the Expert video series. I'll give you some education on this. But uh, let me ask you this question, Steve. I walk in your office and I say, I I've got this idea. How do I know that you're not going to steal this? Do I need to get you to, to uh, sign an NDA? Well, um you do not need to have uh, an attorney sign an NDA uh, because of their uh, ethics rules um, require them to treat you know any information they receive as confidential information. So the way the way that our you know onboarding of a client takes place typically is we first find out generally what tech you know tech area that you know they're getting into or what the business is. We then uh, do a conflict check at a high level just to see if we've got any other clients that would be a direct conflict with that uh, potential client's business or um, direction they want to go in. And then if that's clear, you know, then we'll, we'll take more information from the client um, about what they're doing. So we start out with some very general information that's not confidential. It's just sort of like, hey, we, I want to build a widget. Um, they're not telling us what kind of widget, what their special widget sauce is. And then we say, okay, let's check and see if we have any other clients that are in the widget business and whether they might be a conflict. So we do a conflict check clearance. And then once we do that, we receive the information, more information from the potential client, or maybe they've become a client by this time. Now, do you need them to sign a non-disclosure? No, because our ethics require us to protect their information uh, at far greater degree than an agreement could ever, um, you know, protect them. Now, sometimes people still insist on it. And since it's really no additional burden on us, we oftentimes will sign them. We're like, well, look, we're already, we're already like doubly more worried about just, you know, disclosing your information under our ethics rules than this agreement could ever do us. So we'll, we'll sign them if people really are that worried about it. 
is uh, how, how do you, uh, you guys have mentioned Ramya about finding a good attorney. How, how do you go about finding a, a good attorney and how do you know that you're not, you're, you're, you're not getting someone who is, uh, how, do you, how do you find a trustworthy attorney uh, uh, is my question. That's a great, that's a great question, right? Especially if this is an area that's new to you or, you know, you, um, you've never used lawyers before. You don't know a lot of people that have used lawyers. Um, you know, I'll say I was, before I started the the legal career, my family's probably in that boat. If you, if you asked, you know, my family, who's a good patent lawyer, but that's, you know, this is, I'm old. This is pre-internet. Like, let's open up the white pages, right? <laughs> Um, but I think referrals, right? Um, that is always my go-to for most services. If you can find somebody that somebody else has used and liked, that's a good, a good sign, right? The other thing that you can do is actually, um, you know, all of this information about patents is public, right? So if you go find an attorney, right? Or, you know, somebody's referred somebody or you find someone off a of Google search, you can actually go to um, patents.google.com and type in their name and you can see what other patent applications they've written, right? And you can see, wow, is this person, do I understand this, right? There's patents are by nature made to be difficult to read. You want them to kind of predict the future, right? Because you know, this is what the technology looks like now that so you're going to have um, property rights over this technology so nobody else can use it, sell it, buy it, export it, etc. make it um, for the next 20 years. So a patent attorney, a good patent attorney wants to take what you have and say, what could this be? Where could this be used? How could this be used? How could this be augmented? They, they should be asking you a ton of questions. Um, where is this going? What's your vision? Where is this going to be in five years, in 10 years? Um, so that's one marker of a good attorney, but the others, you can actually read what they do and say, do I, to the most part, understand what's going on here? Because if you can't understand it, nobody else is going to be able to understand it if it's in your area of expertise where you're actually starting a business, right? So that's one easy publicly available gut check. And the other to me is is referrals. And, and I think, you know, going to your bar, um, figuring out who's, you know, if you really don't know anybody, you can contact your state bar and say, you know, who's, who are people who are patent attorneys that are available and, you know, conscientious ones might actually say like, I'm available for pro bono work on this side or whatever, as Steve had suggested earlier. So, I mean, Steve, do you have anything to add to that? Well, you know, and I think, I think you, you actually mentioned this uh, before when we were chatting before we did uh, do today that, you know, a tech transfer department at a university would be a good place for a student to go Mm -hmm. because they are working with patent attorneys all around their region and they know who is cost effective. They know who's trustworthy, they know who does good quality work. And, uh, you know, I would say the vast majority of patent attorneys are very ethical individuals um, that, um, you know, can be trusted. I mean, in my experience, there's very, I've, you know, I, I can barely name a single person I've ever known in the profession that, you know, I maybe would be a little bit suspect of. I mean, 99.9% .9 of patent attorneys are trustworthy. And I think the thing that you um, have to probably gauge the most is whether they're a good fit for you, because um, some patent attorneys, um, they all have technical specialties, right? Um, some of them tend to, you know, represent different types of clients, like some attorneys spend most of their time writing patent applications for large corporations. They don't really know the ins and outs of dealing with an entrepreneur and what an entrepreneur needs and what their weak spots are and what, you know, what's most important to tell them. Um, and then you kind of have you know, it's, you also have the another element of it getting a good referral is somebody that knows what's not important is as important as knowing what is important. Because, you know, I always say like the, the hardest part about being a great patent attorney is knowing what not to tell your client because it just confuses them. <laughs> um, and, and, and what they don't need to do is more important half the time than what they do need to do because you can waste a lot of time and money doing things that aren't very productive. Um, and when you're a small company and you don't have a lot of resources, that's the last thing you need. 
So, you know, I think finding a good attorney is worth a good amount of effort. And net, if you don't know anybody, it's kind of hard because you got to somehow get networked into somebody that knows who's a good fit for you. Um, and if you get a good fit, it, you'll really enjoy it. And it should be somebody you like working with too, not just competent. I mean, it has to be somebody you have a good rapport with. That's my two cents worth on that. Steve, if I walk into your office, would you be offended if I ask you for references? No, not at all. I mean, that's, I had actually, when I see that, I actually think, okay, this person's really doing their due diligence. This person really wants, you know, to get somebody they can trust. And so, no, it's not, it doesn't offend me in the least bit. I mean, we're all auditioning for our clients, right? Because, you know, you want to really do everything you can to win your client. You know, you don't want to just, you know, they shouldn't trust you completely unqualifiedly. You know, that's, it's in their best interest to always be thinking also about what they're, you're telling them, make sure that it matches up because sometimes they'll give you advice that maybe doesn't fit, not because it's malicious, just because, you know, maybe they don't know everything that's going on. So it's always good to, it's always good to be questioning your attorneys, all your, all your advisors, right? You know, <laughs> it's kind of like if you were going to go in and have somebody take over all of your retirement, you know, accounts, you know, you'd want to be pretty sure that they were very trustworthy and that you'd want some references. And I think this is your baby you're bringing to them, right? So you should make sure they can, you probably would spend more time getting, you know, references for babysitters than most people do for lawyers. So that's, that's you know, think of it as your baby, you know, you would want some <laughs> references. You know, so let's say that uh, you guys have given me a lot of advice, but I've already told investors, I've already told friends, I've already told these other people, uh, can I still get a patent, Ramya, if I screwed up or what, what, what advice? I mean, I'm sitting here watching this, this, this presentation. What, what do you, what do you tell me? No, you have, you can totally potentially still get a patent, right? I'm so the, the, a patent has to be novel and non-obvious, non-obvious. Those are the two kind of big things along, along with the, a bunch of other kind of things that your patent attorney can help you work out. Right. But it has to be something that's new that nobody has done before. And that's not, obvious to do based on what's out there, right? Like for example, um, if, if you if you make a new a new like basketball, right? All the basketballs are orange and you're like, you know what, I'm gonna get a patent on a red basketball. That's that's a pretty obvious change to change the color of something, right? You can just dye it. It's not something that really takes innovation to figure out, oh, I want to do this, right? Unless there's some reason that making it that different color gives it special properties or special effects, right? And it's it's not, it's it's more difficult to do than you might think, right? So the the two really big um, kind of cornerstones of a patent are those two things. And so if, you know, if the people that you've talked to haven't copied what you've done, aren't making and using it, if, you know, those are the things that you need to see of what's out there in the market in terms of products and, and research and development that's going on. So yeah, you can totally still get, you can still get a patent. Um, Steve, Steve, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I would say, you know, that it just uh, it's always easy to think of things to add when somebody else, you know, uh, plows such a nice opening for you. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, you know, I think certainly one of the cardinal rules of getting a patent is that you, you want to file an application before you publicly disclose your idea, if you can. Now, um, if you you do have a one year in the U.S. Uh, from when you publicly disclose, and what publicly disclose means is can be a little bit nuanced. But if you publish a paper, it's a public disclosure. If you tell your sister about it, that probably isn't a public disclosure. But uh, you know, in, in in under the circumstances of hey, I want to tell you about my great new confidential idea, and then <laughs> everything in between you know, it could be maybe it's a public disclosure, maybe it isn't. So the best thing is, is keep a confidential file before you start telling anybody that hasn't signed a confidentiality agreement. But just because you told somebody doesn't make it public um, and you need to consult an attorney on that. I couldn't, I couldn't even begin to tell you the, all the rules involved, but that would be, you know, I guess two cardinal rules we've covered so far. One is confidentiality is important. Number two, don't, don't, don't publicly disclose your idea before you file 
a patent application. Because if you do that, you could destroy your foreign rights, even if not your US rights, because all foreign countries, except for a couple of exceptions, require you to file before you publicly disclose, um, or you're not entitled to even seek the patent. So I'm an entrepreneur and I'm strapped for cash and uh, you guys keep talking about these. Why, why is a, a patent or why are these trade secrets or trademarks or copyrights? Why are they? Are they important to investors? Are they important? Why, are, why do I want to seek these rights? I'll, I'll, I'll toss it up in the fun. air for what Rob, for Ramya I gives better answers than I do. So I'll Ramya, to, take it away. I'll <laughs> fill in what's left to color in. <laughs> sure. So, um, so I think there are a lot of different reasons to get IP protection, right? Um, really, it's to protect what you're, it's to protect the company that you're building. Um, but it's also a signal to the outside world that what you're doing is innovative and that it's getting traction in the market. So I'll talk about it from both perspectives. From the, the, per, the, from the first perspective, right, you want to get IP protection because if you're creating a new product that's innovative, right, or you have a new brand that is really starting to become something that people talk about, if you have it copied by somebody else and there's nothing that you can do about it because you haven't gotten IP protection, then you're out of luck, right? Um, it's it's There's more um, innate protection, I think, on the trademark and the copyright side, right? You can, you can file for a federal trademark or a state or you can file for a federal copyright. That gives you more... Um, more options or recourses if somebody copies your work. But the beautiful thing about branding and marketing is that a, a copyright, for example, exists from the moment of the time of creation of the thing that you want to protect. So if you created a picture of your logo, if you have a jingle, if you've got source code that you've created, that is all immediately copyrighted upon creation and you own that copyright. The problem is other people might not know about it. That's why you wanna get a federal copyright where you actually register it, right? The same thing with a trademark. If you're selling goods in commerce, you might have a trademark in your state, right? But you don't have a federal trademark that again, people know about. And it's much less likely to get um, stolen or copied if people are aware that you're doing the same thing, right? It's, it's, a, it's a signal to the outside world that you're building this brand, or you're creating this product. On the patent side, there's no fallback. Um, if you don't get a patent on the innovative thing that you're creating and somebody copies it, you're out of luck. Right. Um, so really, if you want to scale what you're doing, if you have something that could, that could get patented, the earlier that you can do it, the better. Um, on the flip side, when you're thinking about investment, if you've got this intellectual property, not only is it a signal to your investors that you see that you're going to become a company that needs this kind of stuff, but it also shows that you're thinking about aspects of your business beyond just the customer and the product. And it's a signal that you have something innovative. Investors are getting hundreds, thousands of pitches every year, right? Just having a patent sets you aside from maybe 60 or 70% of them, right? And anything you can do to set yourself apart and to say, listen, this is, I'm not the only person saying this is innovative. The government has said that this is innovative and given me a patent on it. And this is something where nobody else is going to be doing exactly what I'm doing that's patented by this technology. That gives an investor a comfort level that, wow, if I put money into this, this isn't something that's going to be immediately copied or if it is, there's recourse, right? So you're creating a niche and a space for yourself that's publicly recognized. And I think that's the other reason to, to really make the investment because it is a financial, a, a significant financial investment into the intellectual property. Steve? I, I agree with everything Ramya said. I'd say that... Um, there's no reason not to get a patent if you've got innovative technology other than cost or the uh, need to disclose, you know, the, the uh, technology in the patent when it gets issued or when it gets published. So if you've got technology that is going to be readily 
discernible from the product. So in other words, you know, there's nothing you could really protect as a trade secret. If your idea is going to be evident in the product that gets sold, then you don't really have much to gain by, you know, not following from a confidentiality perspective, because that's going to be destroyed when you sell your product anyways. Um, then the only other reason not to get a patent is because it costs money um, or it's going to be such a weak patent that it's not worth getting. But if you're starting a business around IP that is that weak, you maybe want to reconsider, um, you know, w- you know, whether that's a good business to get into. And, you know, I, I, I teach a uh, course. Uh, it's basically uh, just a couple hours every quarter for uh, entrepreneurs in the med tech area. And I'll say there's like two ends of the spectrum that you're going to fall into. And med tech patents are super important. Um, different technology areas, patents are, you know, have relative importance, but they're very important in med tech because you have a long period of time to take to get the technology approved through the FDA many times. And, uh, by, and, and so you're waiting and waiting and you're developing. And then uh, once it's approved, somebody else can just come along, copy you, and uh, they don't have to go through all that expense. So you really need to watch for people writing your coattails. But I always tell people in that class, I go like, you're either on one end of the spectrum is you're the first, you know, to come up with a really great idea. There's nobody else has an idea that's very similar to it. Um, you're going to be able to get great patent protection because there's very little prior art, as we call it, prior technology that would impinge upon your ability to get broad protection. There's no freedom to operate issues because there's no other patents out there that you need to worry about, um, which was something we haven't talked about yet, but we should probably touch on for a second. And so that's the great end of the spectrum to be on. Um, most of the time, you don't, you don't land exactly there, but once in a while you do. And then on the f- other end of the spectrum is you're late to the game. You're, you're filing a better mousetrap, you know, uh, the 10th better mousetrap. There's tons of patents out there already that you need to worry about. You're not going to get very good IP protection because there's so much prior art. So an entrepreneur definitely wants to be on the first scenario I described. They want to be early into something where there's not a lot of prior technology that they need to navigate through. But most of the time people fall, you know, uh, somewhere in the middle or somewhere closer, hopefully to the beginning of the technology cycle um, where there's still a lot of opportunity. Um, And if they're at the beginning, they definitely want to file patent applications because they could get some tremendous patent protection if they're pioneering in an area. And usually that pioneering takes place over a period of a couple of years. I mean, they may get the initial idea, but then they start to develop it and they start to see the problems. They start to solve more problems and you can develop a great little patent portfolio. And I I would say that another point on this that's probably important to emphasize is that sometimes entrepreneurs get overly, uh, they fall in love with their patent portfolio too much and forget that ultimately what's going to make the business successful is you've got to find some people to buy your product. <laughs> um, Cause if you don't, you're not going to, you know, you can have all the patents in the world and you know, you're not going to have a successful business. Um, you might have some IP that you can sell when your business doesn't succeed and that's good, but it's not patents that make your business successful. It's customers that want to buy your products. And to that point, once you start down the road of developing a brand in the marketplace, getting those trademarks that Rami recommended uh, settled up front is super important because you don't want to get all this name recognition and then have to change your name because you didn't do your homework up front. I would put that on our list of the third thing you should never do is which is start using a name before you've cleared it because you don't want to have to change it after you've you know, been out there for even a year hawking your, you know, your company around to try to get funding. And then all of a sudden, hey, you got a new name. You know, that that's not good. So anyways, that's that's a, a little bit of advice there. Hey, Steve. Steve, uh, actually, you... oh, John, if it's okay, let me, let me... I want to follow up with one tiny thing there. Oh, yep, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I've, you know, I, we've been talking about companies that should get IP protection. And Steve, one of the things you mentioned was when, when you don't, and I just want to follow up on, you know, a lot of small businesses 
do not get patents, right? A lot of large businesses do not get patents. So it really does depend on the area that you're in, right? If you're in the service industry, the, you know, a lot of the, the restaurant stuff like clothing and apparel, there might be stuff that, that could be innovative that you could get patents in. But if you're in a business area where you're not getting a patent, and others in your industry aren't getting a patent, don't stress out that it's not something you're getting either, right? Because I think that can be something that can be a source of stress as well. Like, oh, I don't have a patent on this, right? And and depending on the industry that you're in, that could be totally okay. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll follow up two other areas, chemical formulas, um, depending on what the formula is, you might not want to disclose that because to get a patent, the idea is that the government is giving you a right to exclude others from making, selling, importing, et cetera, your technology or your innovative feature. But in return, you have to disclose how you do the technology, right? So Coca-Cola, for example, they're probably the most famous company in the world that didn't patent their Coca-Cola formula. They trade secreted it. It's in a secure vault. <laughs> um, nobody knows what it is, right? So a lot of these chemical formulas, I would say machine learning algorithms, a lot of those people don't disclose because you don't want to give away how to create your machine learning model, right? Or your neural net or your, your deep learning algorithm. Um, so things like that, again, consult a patent attorney, but think about, does it make sense to patent? So sorry, John, I'll, I know I interrupted, so I'll, I'll turn it back to you. No, I appreciate you, you mentioning that. And, you know, while you were talking, I was thinking that the three of us could talk about these are this is a topic that's not only has been our profession, but it's something that we're quite passionate about and that we could it's it's unfortunate that we're limited by time uh, because I think the three of us could could talk for hours and days. About, <laughs> I don't about know if each, that's a good thing or a bad uh, thing. Or, you know, I think it's a good listen. thing, but the students can <laughs> or, or the, our listeners can decide that. But uh, Steve mentioned that he teaches a class on entrepreneurship and medical devices. And I know that there's a lot of medical devices that come out of the Twin Cities. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to know that something that we may be able to include in the show notes uh, is, is, do you provide that class with a checklist of things that entrepreneurs need to consider? Or is there a place, a resource that students, our, our listeners can uh, find uh, a checklist of things because we've mentioned, I mean, it's, it's drinking from a fire hose at this point and I'm an IP lawyer uh, is, is the things that we've mentioned. Uh, do you, do you, you know, have I, any resources? I, don't know. I definitely know there are resources. Like I know that just like our, our website of our law firm, we've got um, a lot of material for um, startups and entrepreneurs and, um, cover a wide range of topics and some of those would have essentially checklists you know that you need to go down um i don't hand out a checklist at that course but i do have a powerpoint and if anybody wanted to contact me about getting a copy of that i'd be happy to share it with them because it's not confidential or anything it's um so if they reach out to um uh, either me or to ipo or to whoever uh, that is affiliated with this program, I can get a copy of it to them. That's great. Now, another thing that you brought up that I want to ask Ramya about is that I know a little bit about Ramya's business and that you mentioned something, Steve, in your last comment is that, okay, I get a patent or uh, I'm, I've got an idea that it's patentable. I have a name that I want to use. How do I know that I'm not infringing someone else's rights. Ramya, I know that you have some experience in this and you help mainly larger companies, mid to large size companies, uh, understand the patent landscape. Uh, can you explain a little bit about, is that a concern for me as an entrepreneur, for me as a company, for me, uh, can, can you give us a, uh, some background on that? Sure, so, you know, I think, Early on in your entrepreneurship journey, one of the first things you should do, um, and this is kind of part of it, is figure out who else is doing this, right? Um, and that comes down to good old Google searches to see what are the other companies that are in this space, um, using things like Crunchbase to see what other startups are doing what in the space that I'm looking to start this company in. 
going to Google Patents, which is another, it's a resource I mentioned earlier, just typing in your technology and seeing what are the things that come up that are relevant, Google, you know, to just see, is this something that's super competitive? Is this something that's actually different? Is this something that's worth putting so much of my time and effort and resources and money into, right? And so that should be kind of one of the first things you do when you think about, I have an idea, to see how many other people had that idea and are solving it the same way. <laughs> so you can actually make sure you've got a little bit of niche in the market that you're looking at to say, this makes sense to go forward. Um, with larger companies, right, and companies that are, you know, or mid-sized companies, companies with larger budgets, right, they want to say, okay, I want to, you know, I potentially want to do a search to see before I file a patent what's out there. I think that makes sense for everybody. Um, before you spend the money, because a, 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 to file a patent, um, you have to spend, you know, a couple thousand, around a thousand, around a thousand dollars probably to get for government fees for filing it. Since you're a small company, you've got to spend anywhere from maybe eight to 12,000 on average to have an attorney work on drafting the application for you. And so that's a significant chunk to spend to get this patent. So it's worth it to spend maybe a, you know, a few thousand, you know, around 2,000, 2,500 to have that same attorney or somebody else do a search and say, what else is out there to say, okay, even if something hasn't been in a product, there might be somebody else that filed a patent with a failed company or within a larger company that didn't decided not to go down that route. But they'll look at the same sources, ideally, that the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office will look at to say, this is a novel, non-obvious patent application or it's not, right? So you'll, you'll get that sneak peek at what's available out there. Um, to say, should I, is it worth investing the larger amount of money in the patent? So I don't know if you look at it from an infringement perspective, I think that's a whole different story. Infringement for, for those who might not know is saying, somebody else has a patent that, that, is, that is the same technology that I'm doing. I'm not, I may or may not be aware of it, but I am, I'm inadvertently copying somebody else's patented technology. What you wanna make sure I think going in is nobody else has that technology that you're looking to patent. So it's kind of too, flip perspectives of that same coin. Um, but that would be kind of how I would approach it. Dan, I, I would second that. I think that's very good advice. Um, for patentability, you know, we classic uh, old time patent law was someone would bring in, you know, a widget, you know, that they wanted you to patent. And when I, to say this, but when I started out, we were still patenting farm implements, uh, you know, from farmers. Um, and that quickly switched to pacemakers. But in the beginning, and they come in and go, hey, can I get a patent? And we, first thing we say is, well, we're going to do a patentability search to see whether or not your idea has been taken. And people would literally go down to the patent office or the patent office has all, I had all kinds of searchers sitting in their library and you would send them a fax or a, a letter, call them on the phone and ask them to do a search. And they'd go look through the patent office, see if they could find any similar farm implements in this case. And uh, then they'd send you a report and they go, I found some things that look kind of like it. Um, and then you'd look at them and decide whether or not they were going to preclude your client from getting a patent as a patentability search. You're still doing the same thing, except for it's all done online. Um, and it's done by many different uh, places. You can get these searches done now for, you know, uh, fairly inexpensively. I mean, sometimes your attorney a lot of times we'll, if I have somebody comes to me with something like that, I'll just go on and take a quick look to see if I can find it right away um, without much effort. And if I can, it's the end of the story because once you find that their idea's already been done, you know, they're finished. Um, but usually you can't find exactly what they've got. And so you can have people uh, in the States, their search operations, there's a lot of searchers uh, that are offshore uh, in India, there's a lot of great searching uh, facilities and they're not that expensive, but you know, you need to get the search and then someone needs to look at it and assess whether or not it's gonna make a difference. So that's patentability search. The freedom to operate part, which Brian alluded to, which is okay, uh, am I going to infringe somebody else's patent if, if I make my product? So. Just because the patent the patent in office gives you a patent doesn't mean you have the right to make it, which is a really weird concept in patent law. It just means that you have the right to stop others from making your invention. But somebody else may have gotten an earlier patent 
that is broader than the one that you're getting and actually could stop you from making your invention, even though you've got a patent. So just being able to get a patent doesn't give you the right to do it. So you did these things called free and property searches, which we look at who else has got patents in the area that you may need to worry about. And those are those can be much trickier to do. Um, in the area of med tech, tricky, but very necessary because no one's going to invest a lot of money in uh, med technology that isn't been cleared by a patent council. And, um, it, you know, if you're do, doing a machine learning algorithm, I'd say skip it because you're never going to be able to figure it out anyway. So that's where you need to talk to a patent attorney. Do I need to do an FTO, a freedom to operate search? And I'd say most of the time, you don't need to because of various different circumstances, but sometimes you really do need to do those if you're going to get big time investors. Now, one last point on this, and because I think Romney mentioned it earlier, which was signaling your investors or signaling people. If you go to a patent attorney and ask them about the FTO and get their opinion, you don't need an FTO, that's a lot better when you go to get money, the investors go, they go, hey, did you get a freedom to operate search and FTO? And you say, no, I didn't. And I don't think I need one. They're gonna go, ah, that's a red flag that the, that the entrepreneur is clueless. Um, what you need to do is you go to say to them, I talked to Ramya and she said, I don't need one. And here's why we don't need one. And then they go, fine. You know, but if, as soon as you say, I just decided myself, I don't need one. Now, immediately, their regard for you is dropped about, you know, an order of magnitude because they know that you're unsophisticated and you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so um, it's, it's really more about the process you go about deciding you don't need to do something like that than it is the fact that you're not doing it that, that counts the most or, or are doing it. So Rami, did you want to add to that at all? No, I, I think you yeah. covered it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, so I, I go to school and I also work somewhere and I'm working in a lab somewhere at night and I'm going to school and I'm taking chemistry classes or computer engineering classes or working coding for someone on the side. Uh, I'm getting ready to come in and talk to you about filing a patent application. Do I, is there anything I need to worry about? Do I own, do I own the idea? Can can one of you guys, Steve? I'll let yeah, you start. I'll let you I'm start to go first, from, so I don't yeah. know. Ramya tees such... you up. Ramya tees you up really well. Ramya, <laughs> why don't you start off with this one? Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, so that is a um, a loaded question. First of all, so I think it depends. If you're working and the idea came based on the work that you're doing, uh, it depends on what kind of contract um, or employment law exists with within your state and with your, uh, with your company, right? So there's a lot of companies that say, if you created something using company resources on company time, using um, information you learned from the company, whatever you created is the intellectual property of the company, right? If this was something completely independent, I think still check your contracts, um, your employment contracts and all that stuff. But if it's completely independent, it may be something that you can go in and, and patent, but it really is a, I hate the, it depends, right, from a lawyer, but it really does depend on on what the idea is, where it came from, how you got there, and what you're going to do with it. Yeah, and I would, um, I guess I could supplement that with saying most, uh, well, first of all, the, co the core concept there that you're dealing with is inventorship, and whoever has the, it's the conception of the idea which makes you an inventor. Um, and so you have to participate in the conception of the idea in order to be considered an inventor. And so if you, if you were the only one that came up with the idea, you're clearly the inventor. Um, if it's you and uh, other people, then you may all be inventors. That can get a little tricky, but let's assume that you're the only one that came up with the idea. You're the inventor. Now the question is, is do I own the invention? And if uh, you don't work for anybody and you've got no contracts with anybody, you're gonna own the invention because there's no obligations owed to anybody else. Um, or if, I guess I should add, if you didn't go in and use somebody else's you know, equipment or something to make your invention and they maybe you know, wanna claim a piece of it, 
Um, but normally, if you don't have an employer and you don't have any contracts, you're going to own it. There's going to be no question about that. Now, if you work for somebody, then the question is, is, um, is it an idea the company can claim they own or do you get to keep it? Um, and the same thing can kind of take place at the university. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a student at the university. Um, I'm not a grad student. I'm just a student. I come up with an idea. You're not working with any professors in any labs. It's your idea. If you're working in a lab, then you've got the possibility that the university has a policy that maybe they have a claim to the idea because you used it using their resources and maybe with some of their ideas too. But if you're an employee, most company or most uh, states have laws that say that an employee um, cannot be required to assign their invention to the corporation if it's done outside of their scope of their employment and without any company resources. And it's an area that the company doesn't have any research or development in. So if you, you're doing something completely different, your company makes, you know, if you work for 3M, because 3M does so many different things that maybe not such a good. If you're working for Boeing, okay, and you come up with, you know, a new dog leash, you're probably not going to have any problems. So, you know, that's the analysis. <laughs> does Boeing make dog leashes? No. Okay. I'm, I did. I do it at work. No. Okay. We're good so far. You know, did I use any of their equipment? No, you're good. You know, <laughs> so that's the analysis you go through. And most states have those laws. Um, but if you're doing something that's in the scope of your employment, if it's an idea that your company might, might be interested in, and you know, then you're pretty much, if they've got an agreement with you to assign, you're done, they're gonna own it. Or if they have a reason, even if there's no agreement, if they hired you to invent and you're inventing in the area that they hired you to invent in, then they're also gonna own it, even if they don't have an agreement. So that's a short course in inventor ownership or uh, invention <laughs> ownership. And, and a good reason to see a lawyer, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, after listening to this, I thought I was going to be an entrepreneur, but you two have made me want to become, uh, get into the intellectual property field. What, what if I decided, <laughs> what if I decided that I wanted to become a, a, an intellectual property attorney instead of an entrepreneur at this point, which as, as I've mentioned, Steve, you are both an entrepreneur and, Ramya, you are both an intellectual property attorney and an entrepreneur, but what, what if I want to become an intellectual property attorney? What about careers in intellectual property? Sure. So, oh. I mean, there are, oh, sorry, Steve, no, no, go no, ahead. No, 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 I'm happy to have you lead. <laughs> I just, I figured that's been the pattern. I'll just jump right no, in. No, no, and I, I love <laughs> it. Go ahead. I just uh, didn't so, want to make you lead every time. So go, go ahead. <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah. Um, there are a ton of different ways that you can get involved in, um, in IP and in the patent world. Um, I started out at the Patent and Trademark Office, right? Um, and they look at patents from every single industry. So what you really need there is some sort of background that has, um, you know, math or science or you've taken classes in that or, um, you know, there's a, a whole set of requirements. Um, that you can look at to join the patent and trademark office. I absolutely loved it. They have, they start off with a six month training program. So they actually teach you everything you need to know about patents, about the patent law and the legal space, how to do everything. It's a fantastic way to get into intellectual property, I think. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a secure, great government job. You can also become a, a patent agent. Um, so you don't have to go to law school, right? If you wanna get your, if you wanna dip your toe into IP, you can actually, every, every patent lawyer, pat, anybody working in the patent space has to pass a bar exam called the patent bar. And again, the requirements for that are available online. There's tons of study guides, um, both in books and online formats. You can take courses for it. But if you pass that, you can actually work at a company or at a law firm as a patent agent doing a lot of the similar work the patent lawyers do. And again, it's another great way to see, hmm, is this something that I actually like before making the investment of going to law school? Um, I actually did both because, uh, you know, I had gone to Carnegie Mellon. I had all this student loans <laughs> from Carnegie Mellon. I'd, I'd been a programmer. I wanted to make sure this was something I wanted as a career before um, taking on kind of the additional um, time and, 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 you know, debt of law school. Um, so I would, I would actually recommend both of those to, to somebody thinking about it, right? And just start talking.
talking to as many people as you can. Reach out to bar associations, reach out to the IPO um, Education Foundation. Talk to people and say, what do you do every day? What is it you like? What is it you hate? What is it you know, that excites you? Um, and see if that's a good fit for, for you too, right? Um, the more people you talk to, the better. Yeah, it's a, um, that's a great answer. I, I do think it, you know, for my, well, first of all, let's talk about opportunities. I think it's a great time to enter the patent profession right now. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, you know, in the upcoming years. Um, there's a lot of people exiting the profession that are, you know, essentially started. There was a big bolus of people that came in um, about the time I did, and then they're sort of retiring. Um, technology, the use of the patent system keeps growing. It's more and more important. Uh, it's more and more complicated. Um, and the tech, the, the uh, technology is always fun to work with. Um, it's so fun to work with people that are excited about their inventions. Um, I, you're, 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 you're dealing with very creative people um, that love, you know, new technology, love making new things. They're entrepreneurs, they want to build businesses. So you, you're built, you're just dealing with a lot of people that have a lot of optimism, <laughs> which is really nice. Um, or maybe if you're litigation, patent litigation, you're dealing with people that are now trying to like enforce their patents. So, you know, they've, they've, they've already been successful. Um, they've created something of value. And so now they're, you know, that's interesting to be there. So, but it's a great, I, one of the reasons I got into patent law is I used to love to read popular science and popular mechanics. I loved learning about new technologies, new ideas. And I thought, you know, I like being an engineer, but wouldn't it be cool to be just sitting around you know, like every day you just go to the office and your desk is just full of popular science and popular mechanics. Um, and that's what it's been like. And it's been a great ride and working with just wonderful people um, in, in the, both in the profession and the, but also all the entrepreneurs and inventors. So that'd be my pitch for why it's a lot of fun. And if you've got a personality that matches up with not wanting to just sort of sit in the lab and crank away on developing technology, but you'd rather be around more people and you'd rather interact with more people um, and meet new people all the time, you know, maybe it's, you know, you might be interested in patent law. You know, you make a, you, that's what I found is that it's an extremely positive type of law. And you also get to see a number of different innovations come, come across your desk. And uh, I know you guys have mentioned how, how positive the law is and how, how uh, the patent bar is so, uh, uh, there's trustable. Uh, it's because it's a small bar. It's not nearly the size of the, the regular bar. And so there's a small community of us and you have to be careful about your name in a small community. And so I've, I've, I agree with both of you. It's a wonderful opportunity uh, to do interesting work and work with good people. So I, I've, I've, I've noticed, you know, we call it the practice of law and you guys have agreed on, on everything. So I appreciate you guys, you guys agreeing on everything in today's contentious society. Right. But uh, it's uh, but I've actually really enjoyed it. And uh, I appreciate uh, your time today. Before we go, do you have any final comments to your uh, to our listeners? If not, I, I think what you just said was was fine. But do you have any final bits of advice for our listeners that may be entrepreneurs, students, or uh, people thinking about going into the IP profession? I'll let you go first on this one, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's that's, um, that's a curveball I threw you. Maybe we can maybe we can edit it out or something. <laughs> you know, I think it's probably I don't have any you know you know big. Uh, you know, bucket full of wisdom on this one to give out. Other than if you are interested in getting into IP, um, be persistent if you, you know, because if you've got certain type of technical background, the doors will just swing open because people are desperate to get certain types of, of technical backgrounds in into patent law. Um, so if you're, if you're in, you know, like double E, 
you know, you're going to find it easy to get a door open, or if maybe software is another one that's pretty easy to door. But if you're in, in other areas, sometimes it takes, it's harder to find a place, but don't give up. Just keep banging away because um, you will find a niche and you'll get in there and, uh, you know, just hard work, persistence, determination. Um, you just have to keep slogging away and uh, you can become a very successful patent attorney and enjoy your career tremendously because it's a great group of people to work with. Um, it's just a fabulous bar. Um, and I think Ramya is like a perfect example of somebody who's, you know, just full of like wisdom and, and skill and, and obviously very fun person to work with. And, and she's very typical, I think, of a typical patent attorney in terms of somebody you'd really want to be a partner with or, or even have as your lawyer. So if I was an entrepreneur and I was in her area, I would go to see her. Oh, Steve, that's, that's so kind. Of and, and I mean it. <laughs> <laughs> well, right back at you. <laughs> and, you know, I love what you said about the IP world. So I'll say it kind of about, about the entrepreneurship world. I think um, polite persistence, hard work, and just not giving up is absolutely necessary if you want to be an entrepreneur, because you are going to get a hundred no's for every yes, right? I think we, everyone going into that world knows it. And you just have to, you know, you have to pivot and listen to what your clients want, but you have to be persistent in your belief that, and, and your faith in yourself and your company, right? But on a kind of broader note and a, a fun way to end it, thinking about the the entrepreneurship and innovation side, um, even if you don't start a company, everybody's an innovator, right? All it takes to be an entrepreneur, whether you're within a company, whether you want to start your own company, whether you're in a space where nobody thinks about entrepreneurship is just solving a problem that needs to be solved, right? Entrepreneurship and innovation at its core is just how do I solve this problem that needs to be solved? And we all do that. And if you do it in a way that nobody's done before, boom, you just innovated, right? And it's it's as simple as that. And I think when we do that in our daily life, when we do that in school, when we do that in work, take a step back and celebrate it, right? Because I think any time you're thinking about how do I solve a problem? How do I make whatever this is better? That's a good thing for yourself, for your community. And, you know, I'll be all cheesy and be like, say the world, right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I wanted to follow up. I, I do want to thank you. And uh, I've, I've interacted with Steve's firm, uh, Schwegman Lundberg, and they have nothing but the highest respect for you and your attorneys and have several attorneys in your firm that uh, I you. consider not only uh, tremendous lawyers, but good friends. And uh, Rami, I wish that we had the entire uh, time to talk about your startup because what you're doing with patents is, and uh, AI is, is very interesting. And the way you, through the entrepreneurship side of things, the way you seek disciplined customer feedback is, is, is really impressive to me. And I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs and startups at this point. So uh, I wanted to say one other thing, if the listeners have uh, questions, they can uh, send them to uh, foundation at ipo.org. That's F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N at ipo.org. And uh, the, you can also look at the resources on Ask the expert video series. Another thing that's been mentioned today is the USPTO's pro bono for uh, uh, program for patents. Uh, you can go on the USPTO.gov site and find that. Otherwise, you guys represented IPO well, so I thank you very much, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Wish we could go on, but uh, we had better stop now. Thanks, guys. Thank you, John. Thanks, John.